Now then, Buddhism. In order to introduce Buddhism, it's necessary to remember the whole background of the world view of India, the cosmology of the Hindus. Well, now, how does the Hindu see the world? The Hindu view sees it as a drama. And it's simply this, there is what there is, and always was and always will be, which is called the self. That in Sanskrit is Atman, A-T-M-A-N. And the Atman is also called Brahman. The self, according to the Hindu view, plays hide and seek with itself for always and always and always. How far out, how lost can you get? So here each one of us, according to the Hindu idea, is the Godhead on purpose getting lost for the fun of it. And how terrible it can get at times. But won't it be nice when you wake up? Buddhism, unlike Judaism and unlike Christianity, is not very, very frantically concerned with being good. It is concerned with being wise. It is concerned with being compassionate. It is a little different from being good. With having tremendous sympathy and understanding and respect for all the ignorant people who don't know that they're it but who are playing the very far out game of being you and I. There is this additional idea that when the self pretends that it's each of us, it reincarnates through a whole series of bodies, life after life after life, according to what is called karma. Karma it literally means doing, the law of doing, whereby acts occur in a series and they are linked with each other in an unbreakable chain. So everybody's karma is the life course that he will work out through maybe innumerable lifetimes. I'm not going into that because a lot of Buddhists don't believe that. You will find that the Zen people, for example, are quite divided on this. They will say, no, we don't believe literally in reincarnation, that after your funeral, you know, you will suddenly become somebody different, living somewhere else. They will say reincarnation means this, that if you sitting here now are really convinced that you're the same person who walked in at the door half an hour ago, you're being reincarnated. If you're liberated, you'll understand that you're not. The past doesn't exist. The future doesn't exist. There is only the present. And that's the only real you that there is. The word Buddha is a title, not a proper name. It means the one who is awakened from the root in Sanskrit, Buddh, B-U-D-H, to know. The man who woke up, who discovered who he really was. Now the crucial point wherein Buddhism differs from Hinduism is it doesn't say who you are. It has no idea, no concept, and I emphasize the word idea and concept. It has no idea and no concept of God because Buddhism is not interested in concepts. It's interested in direct experience and direct experience only. So from the Buddhist standpoint, all concepts are wrong. Just in the same way that nothing is really what you say it is. You're only really there when you let go of everything and you don't depend on any fixed idea, any belief for your sanity or happiness. There's nothing you can hold on to, so man let go. Because there's no one to hold on to anything anyway. So Buddhism is the discipline of doing that. You discover something much better than anybody has who has a belief. Because you got the real thing. Every teacher of Buddhism is a debunker. But he does it not to be a smart aleck and to show how clever he is, but out of compassion. Just as when a surgeon chops off a bad growth or a dentist pulls out a, a rotten tooth, so the Buddhist guru or surgeon is getting rid of your crazy ideas for you. 
which you use to cling on to life and make it dead. It's absolutely fundamental to an understanding of Buddhism to recognize that its whole method of teaching is dialectic. And since Buddhism is a dialogue, what you ordinarily understand as the teachings of Buddhism are not the teachings of Buddhism, they are simply the opening gambit or the opening process of this dialogue. The point being that Buddhism is not a teaching, its essence consists in a certain kind of experience, in a transformation of consciousness which is called awakening or enlightenment, which involves our seeing through or transcending the hoax of being a separate ego. As I said, it is in the essence of Buddhism to be a developing process because it is a dialogue. You can see the initial steps of the dialogue in our earliest or presumed earliest records of Buddhism in the Four Noble Truths where you have it put out that the problem which Buddhism faces is suffering. This word dukkha, which we translate suffering, is the opposite of sukha. Sukha means what is sweet and delightful. Dukkha means the opposite, what is bitter. You could call it chronic frustration. There are three signs of being. The first is dukkha itself. The second is anitya. Nitya means permanent. Anitya means impermanent. Every manifestation of life is impermanent and therefore our quest to make things permanent, to straighten everything out, to get it fixed, is an impossible and insoluble problem. And therefore, we experience dukkha, or this sense of fundamental pain and frustration, as a result of trying to make things permanent. The third sign of being is called anatman. The word atman means self. Anatman means non-self that there is in you no real ego. It has no physical reality. The ego is your symbol of yourself. The second of the Four Noble Truths is desire, clinging. This is the same thing as holding on to yourself so tightly that you strangle yourself. The cause of dukkha is clinging. If you don't recognize that this whole world is an amazing illusion, a weaving of smoke and you try to hold on to it, you see, then you start suffering, seriously suffering. The third noble truth is called nirvana. This word means blow out. In breathing, you know that breath is life. If you hold your breath, you lose it. Let it go because it will come back to you. But if you don't let it go, you'll just suffocate. Don't cling, and then you're in the state of nirvana. Now then, the fourth noble truth, path. The way of Buddhism is often called the Noble Eightfold Path. In Buddhism, it is taught that everything in this universe depends on everything else. That we have a kind of a huge network, and this is called the doctrine of mutual interdependence. All of it hangs on you, and you hang on all of it. So the first phase has to do with one's understanding of the world. The second phase has to do with action, how you act. Buddhist idea of ethics is based on expediency. If you are engaged in the way of liberation and uh, you want to clarify your consciousness, doing that is inconsistent with certain kinds of action. So every Buddhist makes five vows, five precepts, and they take the three refuges. The refuges are the Buddha, the Dharma, the doctrine, and the Sangha, the fellowship of all those who are on the way. So they take these five precepts, to abstain from taking life, to abstain from taking what is not given, to abstain from exploiting the passion, to abstain from falsifying speech, to abstain from being intoxicated. The purely kind of practical approach to morals, that's the second phase of the Eightfold Path. Then the third phase 
has to do with what we would ordinarily call meditation. Recollection. The word recollect is to gather together what has been scattered. The world is regarded as the dismemberment of the self, the Brahman, the Godhead. So remembrance is realizing again that each single member of the many is really the one. So that's recollection. To be recollected is to be completely here and now, is to be completely alert, available for the present. Because that's the only place that you are ever going to be in. You will find, if you thoroughly investigate the process of experience, that the experiencing is the same as the experiencer. So you, as someone who is aware, and all that you are aware of is one process. And you get to that state by the practice of meditation, which is sitting down quietly and being aware of all that goes on without comment, without thinking about. And when you stop categorizing, verbalizing, talking to yourself inside your head, naturally the separations between for example, knower and known, self and other, simply vanish. If you go through this and you get completely blown out and released and are in the state of nirvana, when you get to the state of nirvana, there wells up from within you compassion. The sense that you aren't different from everybody else. Everybody else's suffering is your suffering. So that he who reaches nirvana doesn't, as it were, withdraw into a sort of isolated peace but as always coming back into the world, into the difficulties, into the problems of life, in compassion for everyone else. You can't be saved alone, because you're not alone. You are the whole cosmos.